You know, South Africa and some other African countries have entered another level of lockdown. And, you know, when we talk about health issues on the continent, uh, we must be talking about the first respondents and uh, those who are actually closer to the people. Talking about the primary health care centers, where Nigeria, Africa's most populous nation, has about 20,000. And of all those 20,000, well, not up to 20% is actually functional at the moment. And today on The Square, we're going back to the basics, looking at the primary health care, because if all else fails, that inclusive, then there'll be absolutely no health care for anyone. Welcome, I'm Suleiman. You know, a uh, lot of things happening in the country and of course uh, a lot of Nigerians were really, really afraid when uh, COVID-19 came. The fears were genuine as the healthcare system in the country is one that doesn't, you know, spark belief. Nigeria has uh, an epidemic preparedness index of 38.9%, uh, rated better than many African countries to respond to the COVID-19 outbreak. Of Nigeria's more than 20,000 primary healthcare centers, less than 6,000 are in good condition. State governments went on a spree of constructing as well as setting up isolation centers as a disease never seen before, asked the country questions of its responsibility to human health. Luckily, the devastation wasn't as grave as expected, and the PHCs, that's the primary health care centers, uh, were exposed, uh, weren't as exposed as Nigerians had thought they would. Uh, but again, it left many with key information. The Nigerian primary health care center story has uh, come you know, some way with the establishment of the National Primary Health Care Development Agency and the Basic Health Care Provision Fund. But none has sparked hope so far. So while Nigeria may be impressively battling the pandemic, uh, its poor primary health care centers remain endemic within a pandemic. Now speaking to us from Canada is Professor Ruki uh, Ogumba. She's the president and founder Jesu Mary Empowerment Foundation, and of course, Dr. Peter Emoyesi, a research fellow, University of Aberdeen, Scotland. Thank you both uh, for joining us uh, to look at this very important talk today. Now, let's uh, quickly start with you, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Ruki. You know, a lot of things happening in the country, and people will be asking your own view as a medical, you know, doctor uh, about uh, the primary healthcare centers. How much have they played in helping Nigeria respond to, uh, you know, adequately to the COVID-19 pandemic? Hi, Sly. Um, thanks for inviting me again. This is my second time on your show. Um, there's not been a very impressive um, response by the PHCs. I mean, um, like you rightly said, you're over 20,000 and less than, I, I don't even think it's up to 20% functioning adequately in Nigeria. And you know that the funding, of course, is very, very poor. And um, currently, I know they're not even testing at the primary health centers for COVID. I mean, uh, the designated testing centers and um, by the federal government. And um, you have to um, access those um, and the federal government initiative. So the primary health centers, even though they should be under the mandate of the federal government, most of the time they are situated in states and the states have to run it in partnerships and they have they're not functioning properly so so far we have been very lucky the covid numbers have not been very high in nigeria and i know that's a factor of testing as well because if you don't test you will not find out who um, has covid and uh, many many times the covid symptoms may make malaria and um, we know sometimes the anti-malarials have been used and has prevented the covid so we don't really know the true numbers of covid um, pandemic in Nigeria. We know that lots of people have probably had asymptomatic COVID and recovered from it, and, and you know, and they haven't really spread it as much as possible. We know that at the border they have been enforcing testing. So once you come in, you have had to have paid for a test. Um, again, designated centres all over the country, 
and these are not primary health centers. Many of them might be private clinics um, so that um, you pay a huge amount. I think now it's about 40,000 Naira to get tested. And so that's how they've been tracking the influx of COVID into Nigeria. And then if you have to leave as well, most countries require you to test. Again, you have to do a test with a barcode. Means, again, it's a federal government initiative with these other clinics. Again, primary health centers have not seen testing. We've not seen you know, talk, talk less of vaccinations and all that. So I would say it's, it's, it's quite shambolic. Um, we know that, for example, I'm from Delta State, we have over 400 primary health centers, and most of it is not even functioning properly, again, for various reasons. But in this particular pandemic for COVID, we haven't seen the primary health centers involved at all. You know, the good thing is that both of you have always uh, visited uh, Nigeria, so uh, we'll, we'll try as much as possible to draw you know, from your experiences uh, whenever you come home being practitioners. Uh, Dr. Mwesi, you've always spoken and uh, told us about uh, COVID-19. Uh, the good thing and uh, is that, uh, you know, we can easily say COVID-19 is at a community transmission phase. And you, you have spoken about this. And this is where the PHCs are most important. Uh, you expressed fears when you were on the program. Uh, what we saw happened in India uh, is uh, something that a lot of people thought would have been happening in Nigeria. But what lessons can Nigeria take from India, even though uh, Nigeria didn't buck, you know, to the pressure of COVID-19 as uh, expected? Um, thank you for having me on your program this evening and good evening to your viewers. Um, I think um, the lessons we can learn from the cases in India compared to Nigeria, there's nothing really much to learn from India apart from the fact that they have the capacity to develop um, or produce um, vaccine, um, such as, um, I think, um, Oxford AstraZeneca um, through the Serum Institute of India. So first, if we want to copy that, we should go back to ensure that we develop our own infrastructure to ensure that we're able to produce or from scratch, develop our own vaccine going forward. So that is the first thing we can learn. But when you look at the similarities between India and Nigeria, um, I've spoken in some other platform where I made my point, saying that when you look at the behavioral patterns of um, Nigerians and Indians, it's almost the same. Um, you know very well, in sometime in December 2020, they declared early victory against COVID-19 and everyone went on the loose without face mask or um, converging in large population ceremonies such as um, um, ritual um, um, ceremonies and what have you, political rallies. Now, when you look at all these activities in India at the time, and you compare that to Nigeria also, it is the same thing. When it comes to political rally, we had quite a number of political rally in Nigeria. When it comes to people not adhering to the non-pharmaceutical intervention, it's also prevalent in Nigeria, just like in India as well. So all the indices that led to the cases in India we also had the same thing in Nigeria. But for reasons we are unable to explain, it shows that despite all of our flaws in the times of response to this pandemic, we've not really reported high level of fatality in the country. So um, the other angle we could do also when it comes to copying the model from India is to ensure that we also go about our own response with a well-infused harm of research. So if we're not reporting the cases as it were, like India did and up to this very moment, then there is something within Nigerians that is actually preventing um, this particular pandemic from holding a grip on the population. Like I said um, um, a few days ago, I said, it seems as if um, Nigeria seems the bus stop for all form of variants in the world. So the UK variants came into Nigeria, nothing happened. And I'm sure also the um, the beta and the data variant, which is um, from India, and also is in the country. I want we are not really reporting high number of um, cases. So clearly, I think um, what we need to do going forward in Nigeria is to look into the way of research to ensure that we're able to unlock the true meaning of COVID-19 in Nigeria. But when it comes to comparison or what can we learn from India or Nigeria, I think there is nothing really we can learn because we share almost the same similarities as far as COVID-19 response is concerned, apart from the fact that India have the capacity to produce vaccine and they are one of the largest vaccine producers in the world. Well, good to see now you're a scientist. Uh, we'll, we'll stretch it, we'll come back to you. Uh, now, let me go back to uh, Dr. Ruki. Uh, you're one of those very uh, few Nigerians uh, who uh, came back uh, as experts uh, to help uh, 
reset and rejig the health sector. And specifically, uh, you actually were a part of a team of people who were in Nigeria's South, South region, Delta State at that time. Uh, what do you think Nigeria should be doing at uh, this point in time to ensure that people uh, can easily, you know, visit some of the primary health care centers, even for the most common diseases or ailment like malaria or typhoid? Uh, because as we've seen, some people still, you know, ignore uh, these centers uh, going straight off uh, to the secondary or even tertiary centers uh, for such, uh, you know, uh, ailments. Yes, so it's um, very interesting that you say um, primary health centers in, in developed countries like where he is in the United Kingdom, I mean Canada, you can't go to a hospital except you have an emergency. So you must see your GP. So your primary health center will be your GP. And unfortunately, in Nigeria, um, many people don't even know what their nearest health center is because um, they're not um, utilized, you know, properly for various reasons. So the first thing about um, wellness is primary health care. Primary means prevention, really, which is actually germane to to, um, to your, your well-being. It's mm. not um, just um, better. It's actually a lot cheaper than cure because if you've got a disease very early, you won't have the complications. I'm talking um, even hypertension complications for diabetes, like I said, even malaria. Malaria kills or HIV or, or even cancers, um, cancer screenings can be done. So for example, here is age related. For example, a newborn baby, we know what we have to do to screen them. And when you're a teenager and when you're a certain age, you know, when you're a male, you check your prostate, things like that, or female cervical cancer, breast cancer screenings, or just general checks for your blood type and um, your blood counts, uh, diabetes, um, check your blood pressure, things like that. Lots of people have all these problems they don't realize because they haven't ever checked. So that's the job of the primary health center. And lots of them have been built. And every time even some, some lawmakers go and even do it as a constituency project. But the problem about health centers is they don't run themselves. You need staff, you need equipment, and it costs a lot. Okay, and many centers are not even properly run because of even poor security. Like you said, I was the health monitor for Delta State from 2011 to, to 2015. And I was checking all the health centers and the primary, secondary and tertiary centers. And we found that some of the health centers were not functional just because of simple things that they didn't have a security guard or a fence. So women who wanted to deliver at night were afraid to, to go there because um, they didn't have proper security. Whereas there were good um, able midwives there. And sometimes just access because of poor roads and um, bad weather and things like that. And then generally in, in some villages, just the old wife still that the old lady can help you deliver more. Whereas you couldn't even do a C-section. Sometimes the babies breach and kind of come out. So um, the job of the primary health center is to may, mainly prevent people going to the secondary and the tertiary health centers. And you shouldn't job that, really. And it's, it's really the job of the, um, the, the government to let people know that this health center exists. And then there's um, the private sector. As you know, we just ran a, an NGO-based um, um, medical outreach in, in Wari, in Osubi, in partnership with the Rotary uh, Club of Osubi. And then uh, we did cervical prostate cancer screening. And we did um, and, um, general checks, you know, malaria, HIV, typhoid, you know, hypertension. And it was outstanding. The response was, was enormous. And it shows the gap, even though Delta State is a health-friendly state because our past two governors uh, are medical doctors. And um, one of them was even in the Senate, this current governor. He was the chairman of the health committee in the Senate. And so Delta State is very well aware of what, it, what is health and preventative care yet. We, we don't meet the need of the people. Like over thousands of people came for a two-day out medical outreach and we found a lot of positive cases and some of them didn't even know where their primary health center is. Some people ask, oh, so you're here for just two days. How are you going to then do it and then continue? No, we do. We check you. Then we'll let you know you need to get followed up by your primary health center. Checking your blood pressure, for example, should be free. Getting immunizations is free. A lot of malaria treatments, they are free because even the William Gates um, Foundation had left them um, IV malaria drugs there that are free. And they even gave some mosquito nets and all that free. And people don't even know that these health centers exist. Again, I don't want to talk about politics and how we use and abuse things. But these um, centers exist. We should use them. They should be largely very cheap and very free. And that's on the government. And again, 
lots of people can pardon the government, but we did because it's never enough. I mean, how many I mean, how many um, hospitals can you have? Hospitals are very expensive to run, to have a proper hospital. And there's lots of private hospitals that are inaccessible because they're really expensive. So the I health think, centers... I think, uh, let me quickly bring in Dr. Moise here. Uh, sorry to cut you there, Dr. Rukia. I'll come back to you because I, I saw him, you know, nodding to some of the key things uh, you were saying. Uh, I'd like to have your views on that. But again, I also recall uh, we've seen some other, uh, you know, conversations you've had in the past talking about uh, you know, investing in experts and a survey, you know, which you said uh, Nigeria hasn't actually done pretty well. If you look at surveys uh, carried out, it show little or no presence of health experts in those centers, and this reduces the confidence people have in them. Uh, how can the government help control this, uh, uh, Imoisi? Um, I think when it comes to healthcare delivery, it boils down to first the human capacity development. So if you have a um, poor level of individuals who are key experts or core experts in a certain area of medicine, then you're going to have issues going forward when it comes to delivery of healthcare system to your population. So first, um, the reason why it's called primary healthcare system or centers is because it's at the level of the primary. And as you know already, in life, you go through primary, secondary, and tertiary. But um, one thing I know about Nigeria, which may be applicable to other African countries, may be the fact that when it comes to the level of um, healthcare education, it's really poor. So first and foremost, you realize that for Nigerians to visit any healthcare center, the first thing they do is to administer some herbs for treatment. It is when that particular remedy fails, they look out for normal um, healthcare delivery system for their ailments and when it comes to treatment as well. So first and foremost, we're not properly educated to know what it is to have a good healthcare system. That is the first angle. And I think the government should invest more into um, healthcare education. So people need to know at what stage you need to visit a doctor for X, X and Y um, ailment or disease or routine check. So that is the first angle. The second angle, like you mentioned, has to do with training of your key um, workforce. So for instance, I know um, quite a number of um, hospitals in Nigeria, which are private, um, they could literally train any individual as auxiliary nurse. And those individuals would then progress to set up their own mini clinic. So you could see that when it comes to the regulation of the healthcare system, that is kind of, um, um, we have an issue in that regard because anyone at all, anyone could just literally open up any form of um, clinic in any jewel location in Nigeria and start running such activities. Mm. Another example, again, is what is properly called the chemist. Here we call them the pharmacists, but in Nigeria, we refer to them as chemist shops. Now, these shops, literally, they dispense drugs to people without any form of uh, medical examination or test, apart from verbal examination. And of course, they're not experts. What can they tell when it comes to um, examination of patients? But these are the sort of... Um, um, platforms that are readily available to Nigerians. So the question is, will you blame Nigerians um, where when it comes to access to healthcare system is really difficult? Then secondly, when it comes to infrastructure, I do know that um, quite a number of primary healthcare system in Nigeria have poor infrastructures. And based on that as well, they are also located in remote areas. Um, here in Aberdeen, for you to go to primary healthcare centers in, um, let's say, countryside, what it government will do is to give you more incentives to attract you to those locations because clearly you are being ostracized from the town into remote areas. So there should be level of incentive to keep people in those areas and then enable them to work effectively through boost remunerations. So that is another angle that Nigerian government could look at as well. Then in that regard as well, once people are aware that these are the available um, tools to them, there'll be high level of confidence. So for instance, Nigerians are not fools, right? They know who is competent. So for instance, while I was growing up and we go to the hospital, my parents would say, oh, we don't want to see Dr. X, Y, Z. We want to see X amount of doctor. Reason being that they've assessed this individual and they know that when it comes to diagnosis, this individual will always misdiagnose individuals. And of course, there is no accountability. So if, for instance, a doctor um, go ahead to practice, I'm um, sorry, operates a wrong procedure. There is no one who is held accountable for any form of wrong procedure in the hospital. And based on that, the life of Nigerians is not really valued at all. 
So the government needs to sit tight, first invest in the healthcare system at the primary level, um, give the required um, adequate facility like running water. So if you go to primary healthcare center, for instance, there are no running waters in those areas. There's no security, there's nothing in those areas. There's no level of accommodation for these individuals. When it comes to proximity, of these primary health care um, centers to the federal medical centers, there is no good proximity between this particular um, um, chain of hospitals. Again, is there any form of uh, medical ambulance? The answer is no. So if, for instance, at the primary health care level, you are trying to deliver um, a child, for instance, and there are complications, there should be readily available ambulance that will lift that patient immediately to the nearest available center that can cater for such complications. But in Nigeria, you do not have those particular um, um, facilities. So clearly, for the middle class who can afford the healthcare system, they will readily avail themselves to public health, health centers where they can pay so much amount of money. So the only way we could do about all these um, um, issues as far as healthcare system is concerned in Nigeria is for the government to take the healthcare system of Nigerians or any, for any other countries in Africa very seriously because okay. a healthy population will give you a viable economy. No doubt. And anyway, thanks uh, to you, uh, uh, Peter, because you, you, I think you made me smile for a bit. Uh, because uh, Dr. Ruki, some of the things he said his parents uh, uh, did back in the day, I, I also, I, I'll ask you, is it wrong? Because I've done that. And I say, I don't want to see Dr. A, uh, because he or she doesn't take his time uh, to go through what, or to listen to me. Uh, that is one for you, uh, Dr. Ruki. And secondly, Tell us the key things uh, that primary health care centers should have or should do. What makes a proper primary health care center? Okay, first of all, I was just smiling that when um, Peter was talking because um, even now, patients do it. They come to the clinic and say, even here in Canada, I don't want to see so, 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 so because of their bedside manner. Uh, <laughs> they don't explain so well or, you know, I just don't get, I don't, you know, I don't spend time. And sometimes it's, it's wrong. And so everywhere, people have their perceptions. So bedside manner is very important, even if you're not as knowledgeable as a doctor. And of course, our patients, our, our parents did that. There's one particular clinic, when they bring the needle, I already start having fever because the, the needle, I don't even know if they sterilized them. They were so painful. So we, we ran away from there. Anyways, um, going back to um, primary health centers, it's actually about prevention. Um, you don't really have to have a very high skilled person there. In fact, in Delta State, there were, when I was special advisor, there's something called a CHU, which is a community health care extension worker. In a very remote place, because to have a nurse or a doctor requires um, quite a bit of training. And, um, of course, um, we, can, we, we insisted on deploying the youth corporate doctors to some of these areas too, so that they would be um, better trained people. But sometimes it's not even feasible to go. Like I said, there's no water, there's no good accommodation, there, there's no light. And so how do you send the physician there? And, you know, it doesn't just work. Well, basically, a healthcare care center must have basic things. You know, you should be able to check blood pressure, you know, check blood sugar, um, you know, check for malaria. And they're very rapid kids that can do that. You don't have to have a standard lab. So, you know, if someone has fever, you should be able to check the temperature and things like that. Um, many of the centers will be the first and last place a woman could go if she's um, going to have a baby, especially if it's sudden. There's something called um, very, very fast deliveries. And so they should be able to take a baby and they should have aggregated health centers. For example, a health center can be known for good, being good for delivering babies. Another one can be known for, for you know, treating um, diabetes and all that. So, you know, the health centers don't always have to be all equal because we know it's expensive to, to have all the equipment. You understand? So, and then to keep them functioning. But simple things like immunizations should be readily available to all the health centers, um, weighing babies, um, checking their temperature, checking their growth charts, things like that. And for adults, just basic screening. You know, you have fever, we have to rule out malaria, typhoid, and I know almost all the tests come back positive. In fact, almost every month, some people are treating malaria, typhoid. So you have to wonder what kind of tests are they using. But still, there should be some form of testing. And if there's no nurse, there should be somewhere, a, a chain of referral. So you don't all go because you have a headache. And this is a case of hypertension to, to the um, secondary center. And it, it costs them um, a lot of choking of the system because you have the same doctor trying to treat a very complicated case, trying to do some basic mundane cases that could have been handled at the um, health center um, and place. So what I'm saying is 
technology can help us too. Even everyone, most of the people have Facebook now. They have social media. I know we've been through there recently. I won't go into that. But you can use an app to know your symptoms and the app will direct you to where to go. When I was in Delta State, I, we are advocating one nurse, one iPad. It means um, there should be collection data as well. So if you've been here for malaria last week and you're having symptoms again, we know that we can't just give you malaria treatment. We have to actually test you for malaria. Um, so technology can help. And many, many apps are free now. You can download health apps, put your symptoms in there, and it can kind of triage you and help you know um, what's wrong with you. And I know we don't have a prescription restriction in Nigeria. So, for example, you can walk to any chemist and buy any drug. And some of the drugs are even not even good drugs. They are from each other, wherever they're making them, fake drugs. We have fake everything in Nigeria, unfortunately. And the regulation is not that good a number where you can check that number if to see if the product is registered. Even with that, there's still fake drugs. And so that's the problem. So people go and self-medicate a lot. I don't know if that's even helping in the COVID. Like you said, we haven't really seen the numbers because we, we take our goal, we take even the gin. I know there was this controversial about Mr. Trump saying that uh, everybody should put alcohol somewhere else. Anyways, bottom line is we're doing certain things. Maybe that's helping mitigate this COVID. That's why we're not dying. But still, there are many, many other conditions that will kill Nigerians that can be completely prevented if the new. If they knew, even HIV doesn't kill. And HIV treatment is still free in Nigeria. It's free. If, you, if you're positive, we can give you antiretroviral drugs. Even as a woman who's never had kids, we can have your child delivered without HIV. And so, so these are information that people don't have. When I came to Worry last um, two weeks ago, they told me, they said, ah, oh, but um, don't take, if you say HIV, nobody will come. Everybody's stigmatized. Until I explained to them that not knowing is actually what kills you. And everybody got tested then, and we had a few positive cases, all confidential, of course, and referrals. But those people have a chance not to have very low CD4 counts that will kill them and secondary infections. So what am I saying? Knowing what is wrong with you is actually what the health centers should do. And each health center should have the minimum, minimum facility to be able to at least check if someone to say, okay, this is what is wrong. This We can't handle this. Go to the next place from secondary to, to, to tertiary. And general prevention, so immunizations, you know, wellness talks, health talks, you know, what a, a good diet is, healthy diet. All those things matter because what you eat matters to how healthy you are. Most people don't even know that, you know, before they used to castigate palm oil, it may not be that bad, but frying things may be worse than that. So things like that, knowing what is a good, healthy diet, how much exercise to take, all these kind of talks, really, really helpful. And of course, a pregnant woman needs to take certain vitamins. Yeah, well, well, I think I think the conversation, sorry to cut you, uh, the conversation is getting yeah. more interesting. Uh, before we go on this uh, very quick break, let me quickly uh, throw this uh, uh, to uh, Dr. Moise Nabatine. Uh, you know, many Nigerians like yourself are exposed to the workings of the NHS uh, in the UK, but very few know that its annual budget is bigger than the entire Nigerian budget. So is Nigeria rich enough to provide state-of-the-art primary health care centers and health care? Um, I would say that yes, we are rich enough to provide um, primary health care centers that are world class. Um, the, the problem with um, Nigeria society is uh, when it comes to um, maintenance, we lack a uh, maintenance culture. So you could literally build a, build a standard um, healthcare facility today. Then you go back there in the next five years, everything is in shambles. So that's where we have um, issues when it comes to maintenance culture. Like you earlier mentioned here in, in the UK, the NHS is actually um, free here in Scotland. And um, recently I had to go on to um, the NHS website or the government website, um, .gov.uk to make a request for anti-G, um, rapid diagnostic test kits for home test for myself. And this um, particular kit came in almost immediately within two to two days it came in. And um, the whole procedures on how to do your own COVID by yourself was rightly laid out in that particular manual. And secondly, once you're done with this test, you are meant to report um, the result through an online platform, which is also linked to the NHS as well. So in the last couple of days, I've done up to I think three COVID tests myself at home here, and I report this information straight to the government website, and that enables the NHS to collect data of people who are infected going forward. Now, when you look at this diagnostic test kit, for instance, they are really cheap. 
And I would have expected that by now, um, 14 months into the pandemic, Nigeria or most African countries should be able to deliver these particular test kits to individual households. Like for instance, in this particular kit, it has about seven um, test kits in it. And that in implies that I take the test every two or three, three days. Now, once I'm, in, I'm done with that, I can request for another kit again and repeat the process because we're trying to reduce the level of infection in the community. But when you bring this same scenario to Nigeria, you then have what you call corruption. So corruption will kick in immediately. Rather than the mm. government providing the required resources to ensure that these kits are procured and delivered to the right individuals, then people will start playing um, anti parking games with, this, uh, with these funds. And in the end, no one gets anything done in the country. So it's not a function if we have the capacity. We do have the capacity. What we don't have is the willingness of people to actually go out there to do the right thing. Like um, um, Dr. Ruker mentioned, you know that I, I know this for sure because I have people that work in NAVDAC and people who are also into drug development in Nigeria. You could literally take a well-standardized drug to NAVDAC for approval. Now, once that approval is granted with the NAVDAC number, what this individual do is to go back and produce a substandard of the original approved drug because they are trying to mass produce this particular drug at a low cost, putting individuals at, um, at um, the risk of any form of um, drug um, toxicity. So if people are aware that my action today will actually hamper the life of an individual who may be a breadwinner for someone else, I'll be very conscious in what I do. But you find out that in Nigeria or many African countries, we are more into the side of business. We want to make money at the expense of people. So once we correct that mentality, both at individual level and at the government level, then we will have the needed fund to actually fund every sector of the economy, both the healthcare system, education, and what have you in Nigeria or in Africa. Well, we'll come back after now. We'll come back. We'll be talking uh, to both of you because uh, you both live uh, in uh, developed countries uh, to let uh, the continent and Nigeria know what's been done differently from where you are based. That's when we'll return. Join us again. Well, the home stretch here on uh, Villa Square Africa on New Central Television. And of course, uh, in Nigeria, healthcare services are delivered by the PHCs, basic health clinics, and comprehensive healthcare centers. Local governments expected to fund these PHCs are also reliant on the state and federal governments for funding. Health, they say, is worth, and no matter how rich a nation is, a poor healthcare system makes high riches arguable. So with me on the square today is Dr. Rukawe Ugumbe from uh, joining me from Canada, and of course uh, Dr. Peter Mwaisi from, uh, from uh, Scotland. Now, quickly uh, before we went on the break, uh, we said we we're going to look at some few things uh, in comparison to where you based uh, on the moment that Africa and Nigeria can put in place to ensuring that uh, primary healthcare centres uh, are better prepared for a pandemic or even uh, an epidemic. Uh, Dr. Ruki, help us, take us through. You've been in Nigeria and you already have a bird's eye view of what uh, uh, operates, especially at the primary health care you know, centres. What are those key things? Now, we're talking about solution-driven conversation now that uh, the Nigerian government or states uh, can put in place uh, to ensuring that uh, 
they have a whole lot in place for the, the people, especially at the grassroots. Thanks, Sarah. First of all, access, critical. Okay, so when you build a health center, people have to be able to get there. So the access is critical. Okay, so um, in the river and areas like, you know, um, for example, the terrain in Delta State, we have waterways and we have um, land um, ways. And so for those river and areas, they should be able to go there by boats and things like that. And we know there's lots of issues with flooding and things like that. So first of all, the health center you built needs to be adequately furnished. So I'm talking accommodations, toilets, fence, and security. Then you talk about the equipment there. It's got to be standard. Then you talk about the staff and the competence of the staff. In general, those are the basic things a health center would have. And then, of course, you have to talk about the um, disposables. You're talking about the syringes, the needles, the drugs, and all those things. You have to check expiry dates and all that. Now, you talked about funding, and I'm sure you knew about the Abuja Declaration and the, in 2001, where they said 1% of the consolidated revenue of Nigeria would be for healthcare. Until date, it hasn't been implemented at all. And, of course, there should be supplementary budget for a pandemic like COVID. And we still haven't seen that um, implemented. Even when the um, legislator said recently that they would give extra money for COVID, we haven't seen anything done. And so if you don't have the healthcare um, system properly funded, how can you have um, an adequate healthcare system? So that's where the private sector is um, raking it in. And like um, um, Dr. Peter said, anyone can set up. You know, people who are not even licensed can set up. And so regulation is an issue. And I know the Medical Council is doing a lot to, to make sure that quacks are not doing the job. But we still have a lot of quacks because of um, the cost. The cost is huge. And um, so people go for a cheaper option, which is not the best option. Like, like you said, even people that are meant to be doing good are doing harm because they are getting the NAFTEC licenses and they are manufacturing cheap drugs. And these cheap drugs are not even having the same quantity or efficacy as... Uh, well, anyway, I think uh, we'll lost that connection. Uh, let me quickly go to Aberdeen, uh, where uh, Dr. Peter is. Uh, you know, Peter Imoisi, you've had uh, Rookie, and, uh, well, still on uh, some of those key things uh, Nigeria should be doing, uh, talking about uh, in the community level, uh, who should be trained first, uh, you know, uh, to be first responders uh, to public health emergencies. Um, you know, how can the people take out uh, this skepticism about such facilities uh, within their communities uh, because uh, it's a potpourri of issues uh, within the people, outside the people, the experts, and all, as well as uh, access uh, to the facility, as uh, Dr. Ruki said. Yeah, uh, I think um, the first thing we need to do as a country is to increase the level of um, primary health care um, education among the population. Now, once these individuals are well educated on the need to ensure that you know your status of any form of um, infectious diseases, that again will improve the lifespan of those individuals. And that again tells those individuals that that is the advantage of knowing your status, HIV or what have you. So that is the first angle. The government should ensure that individuals are well informed and why they should go for medical check. Now, when these individuals present themselves at the primary health care center, you should have competent hands on ground to be able to attend to these individuals. And how do you breed competent hands? It starts from the level of um, the education system. And again, you know that when it comes to our education system, it's not so robust when it comes to the training of these individuals. So the government, again, need to go through that particular route to ensure that the right training facilities are right there for the people to use. And a classic example, for you to know how poorly trained our experts are in Nigeria is when this COVID-19 um, broke out, um, you realize that um, most of the medical doctors and nurses in Nigeria were struggling on how to use PPE on a regular basis. And again, that points out to the fact that there's no adequate training for these individuals. Will I blame these doctors? No, they are kind of a product of a defective system. So when you have a defective system, definitely you're going to produce a defective individual. 
So when the government realized that if we adequately um, fund our institutions and train our people, the life expectancy of Nigerians will increase. And a classic example again is when you look at the life expectancy of South Africans and Nigeria, for instance, I, I want to do that comparison because of um, the economy um, GDP. You know that um, in South Africa is about 6.48. That is the life expectancy of an average South African. In Nigeria, the average life expectancy of a Nigerian is 55.8. That is massive. And that boils down to the fact that when you have a shambolic healthcare system, you have people who don't live long in your country or in your society. So that is the other angle the government needs to go into. Then also, I think when it comes to the expertise, we need to have um, people who are keenly um, specialized in certain areas, not jack of all trade and master of none. For instance, for me, um, I trained up to the level from biochemistry to molecular biology, up to the level of translational neuroscience. And at the level of translational neuroscience, I specialize in molecular neuroscience. That's where I'm domiciled in. So when you bring in other aspects of neuroscience, for instance, say for instance, behavioral uh, neuroscience, I'm not an expert in that area. And when you ask me questions in that regard, I will tell you I'm not the best individual to give you the answer you're looking for. So we should be able to say what we are and what we can't do. Mm. But in Nigeria, it's more like a shame to say you don't know something. There's not there's nothing wrong in the fact or accepting that you're not the expert in this area. If this is who you are, you state who you are and you remain in that area. Now, once you remain in that area, over time, five, 10, 15 years, you become a core and competent expert in that area. So I think we should also advocate for people to carefully specialize in areas. And based on these areas, those are the kind of cases they we readily admit when it comes to patients. Then lastly, I think also we also need to look at the level of um, collaboration. So for instance, I'm here in the UK, for instance, and I'm still here doing research for the university and for the um, society as well. Um, basically, maybe in the next 10, 15 or 20 years, I may likely retire and I'll be close to 60 as well. That is when Nigeria will not come for me and say, oh, there is one professor, ex-Peter um, Moisey, who is in the UK, come head our particular institution. You just have an empty cargo coming home because at that time I'm tired. So we need to ensure that we attract the best of us to lead us in Nigeria and in Africa when these individuals are in their prime, not when they are old. A, a case example is Professor um, Asik Mujishola Adeyeye, who is a NAPDAC DG. She was a brilliant scientist in the UK. But now I think she's in her 60s. She's the one heading NAVDAC. Now all she's doing right now is just to use her level of experience to run the place. But when it comes to um, the level of thorough research, sitting and doing the work, she may not have that energy anymore. So such an individual should be resting. So at every given stage in our healthcare development, we need to ensure that our best of the best are right there at the forefront and we make use of them when they are in their prime and in their peak of their career. And based on that, we'll take our healthcare system to the next level in Nigeria and across Africa as well. Well, key issues uh, I think you've touched on. Yeah, by the way, uh, apologies, uh, Dr. Ruki. Uh, good to know that you're back quickly here. I have something specifically for you because I know you've worked in, in that area and very experienced with uh, family medicine and public health. So uh, perhaps uh, you should be able to help us what you think we can do right from the family front to the PHCs in, uh, you know, breaching the spread or, or rather breaking the spread of infectious diseases. Thanks. So I apologize for that. Um, I'll call it breaking transmission. And um, I'm sure um, Dr. Peter filled in the blanks for me. Absolutely. But what can you do? Um, the, the health of a human being starts from the embryo. So from pregnancy. So, so your nutrition as a pregnant woman is critical to what's going to happen to your baby and the kind of substances you take. I'm talking about drugs, alcohol, things like that. There's certain drugs that are, we call them teratogenic, which will affect the baby and harm the baby. So from, for the family healthcare system, you want to tell people about your nutrition. From that, of course, you have the um, delivery. You want the pregnancy to be hitch free. And each pregnancy has certain times that we look at the woman with physical look and then we, we test like ultrasounds. So we can predict what's going to happen to that baby and make interventions, sometimes even surgery here. If the baby will need surgery, for example, a big, huge hole in the heart, 
we know we can do surgery while in utero. Again, this is sophisticated. But simple things like in Nigeria, you can tell if the baby will probably have Down syndrome or if it has no limbs, things like that. And then give the baby um, op the mother options of what to do. So that's the beginning of life. And of course, when you grow, when you come out, you talk about immunizations. We know immunizations is key to preventing infectious diseases. We rely heavily on immunization. And that's why the Gavi Fund um, has been funding Nigeria for immunizations um, with um, other uh, philanthropic groups like Mr. Gates and, um, and um, Bill Clinton Foundation. And they give a lot of support for immunizations. And then the basic checks that you do as, as a child grows up. So developmental checks. So you expect that by six months, the child will be sitting and uh, rolling over and by nine months, you know, um, trying to move, crawl. And by a year, you know, averagely people should walk. And so when the delays in those process, you would know. And hearing, we know that if you found a child to be deaf very early, you can, you can sign them and teach them and they'll develop normally. Or if you didn't know at all, and then the child doesn't speak or talk until they're they four or five years old, then you know that that child will be severely impaired in learning. So things like that. And of course, there's this um, autism, which is, which is not really a genetic problem, but we've seen lots of it. And early diagnosis of autism can be found even as early as maybe 18 or 19 months because um, the mother noticed the child doesn't play very well with others and, you know, strange behaviors. And again, an autistic child can be a genius. I'm sure we heard the other day Elon Musk coming out and um, saying that he had a, um, Asperger's disease, which which is um, a kind of learning disability, and he's one of the richest men in the world today. And he specializes in taking people out of space. And they thought he was a crazy child as a as a little child, but he was doing very strange things. But because he was well educated, he was able to follow his dream. So basically, this is what primary health um, does to just look at people and find things that are wrong. It's not, it doesn't even have to be highfalutin, just observation, documentation. Oh, this child's head is too small, or the weight gain is not enough. All those things matter. In fact, we know that the size of a human head can actually determine how much you're going to learn. And nutrition is a huge factor in, in development of the child. So just basic um, checks. And of course, when you are a sexually active individual, we know there's certain things we must check. For example, for the woman, we have to check your cervix, make sure you don't have a, um, HPV, which we actually vaccinate for in Canada which is a very expensive vaccine to prevent human papillary virus, which is linked to cancer of the cervix, which is linked to death. And we know that lots of cancers actually are linked to viruses. So immunizations against viruses, for example, hepatitis B, can prevent cancer of your liver. It's critical, and these are routine vaccinations given here to everyone that's born and raised in Canada. And, and I know Nigeria is catching on to immunizations, and I think they've given hepatitis B also free now, but it's not even free for adults. So these are the ways we can make a healthy um, a nation. And I know, again, I'll talk about funding. The funding is very poor. Unfortunately, I was caught off when I was talking about the Abuja Declaration and the 1% Consolidated Fund to fund healthcare, which is really, really short, and it's not been done at all. In fact, the Buhari government in the first, um, what's it called, tenure, did something about that better than even um, the Jonathan government, who had declared this um, Abuja declaration. And still, right now, it's a COVID pandemic, and we know that <laughs> it's, it's a far cry from where we need to be. So general checks, we have age groups and what to check for those age groups. You know, women at certain age should be checked their breast for breast cancer with using mammograms, and men to check their prostate, uh, you know, using simple tools and then the prosthetic, um, prostate and specific antigen. And um, like that, and different um, ages, we, you know, routinely, anyone can have hypertension. So I, I found some 20-year-olds with hypertension in my screening in this um, in this um, health outreach that we did, and the really high blood pressure didn't know they had, and they will benefit from treatment. And if such a man sleeps and doesn't wake up, they'll think he's home trouble, maybe he had a massive stroke. So, so these are the things that we can do. And not all of them requires a high cost, just knowledgeable people. I talked about the apps mm. in the phone. 
you understand, simple apps in the phone, even for the CHU, which is the community healthcare extension worker, by putting the symptoms in, the app can even direct them what is going on. And individuals should be more knowledgeable about your health. Um, Dr. Peter was talking about knowledge. Knowledge is key. If you know what's going on, you can do something about it. So general sensitization of the people to preventative healthcare. Government can do a lot to that. Town criers, healthcare workers, everyone should be knowing I'm 20 years old. What do I need to know about my health? I'm 25, I'm 50 like that. What do I need to know? For example, a man is having difficulty urinating and he doesn't even know that it's not because it was a urinary tract infection. It could be a large prostate, which can be treated, you know, with even drugs and sometimes surgery. So things like that can really impact even on your sexual health. And so all these things are knowledge-based. And not everyone needs to be a professor to know about their own bodies. Let me, let, let me close. Let me, let, uh, all right, Dr. Ruki, let me close here. And uh, I'll take the question uh, now that the treat is not working. But we had uh, this one from Taiwo Akirili watching from California in the United States. And he's asking uh, Dr. Peter Moisey to give uh, Nigerians uh, the update on uh, the vaccine uh, or COVID-19, do people still have the vaccine, vaccine skepticism and uh, how far is it going? Like South Africa, uh, they have a, a vaccine that was tainted from the United States and uh, that number of uh, vaccine, about 2 million, uh, has just been destroyed. So quickly give us that update and so that we can wrap up now. Um, I think uh, when it comes to vaccine hesitancy, in Nigeria, I think it's still on the increase because um, I listened to the news a couple of days ago um, where they were reporting from AKT states that people that had the first dose of the Oxford AstraZeneca are refusing to come forward for the second dose. And um, also those that um, have taken the first dose, people are waiting to see the reaction. So I think we need to do proper education about this vaccine and this particular education should be um, spearheaded by core experts in the field then also, I also think that um, people have this skepticism when it comes to um, the mRNA vaccines. Um, recently, Novavax is also a vaccine platform um, that developed a vaccine for COVID. Um, that particular platform is um, using a protein um, um, platform. And based on that, uh, my question to um, answer vaxxers is, now you have a different platform that is used to develop COVID-19 vaccine. So what is your next argument? Because initially you came up with the argument that, oh, they're gonna change our DNA. Now this same platform that Novavax have used for their vaccine for COVID-19 is used also for HPV, which um, Dr. Ruka mentioned initially. And also that same platform is also used for many of the influenza um, vaccines we have already, already in use in the population. So clearly when it comes to medical education, that's where it comes in again. When it comes to medical education, we are not well informed and people who should be leading the charge are not the one leading the charge. Those who are not the core experts are the one leading the charge in this pandemic. And again, I think the media has a role to play as well, giving the right voices to the right people and trying to minimize the level of conspiracy theorists around the world. And whatever we do today in this pandemic is also going to have a significant impact in, in the near future. Because whatever happens today will play a role in the level of vaccine uptake going forward in the next 10 or 15 years. In any Giving form of voices to the right people, very key there. And that is one thing here on the square. We'll always reach out to, to great minds like yourselves out there and within the continent. Many thanks for being such a nice company, Dr. Rukawe. Ogumba and of course uh, Dr. Peter Moisey for joining us uh, today on The Square. The program returns tomorrow. Bye-bye.